Jeffrey. You look Italian. <laughs> What's up? How are you? I'm okay, how are you doing? Pretty good. You know my motto, right? Which one? I mean, uh, uh, the mean one. Don't fuck it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Let's go. We will not. We will try not to fuck it up. Awesome. Here we go. Jeffrey Gittimer, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So great to have you. For those looking to get to know Jeffrey and his story a little bit better, go back to our episode about a year ago titled Sell or Die, where I speak about how I found Jeffrey and how he helped me get into sales. But uh, today, I wanted to have Jeffrey come back to talk about a few things. One, what the book that was basically made me a salesperson, his sales Bible. And I want to talk about some of Jeffrey's commandments and selling. But before we do that, Jeffrey... I want to start back all the way from the beginning. When did you first decide to write? What got you into writing? Somebody wrote something in the Charlotte Observer, where I, I currently live in Charlotte, North Carolina. It differs from Philly in that fuck you is not a greeting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, waving all the fingers. They wave all, they use all the fingers when they wave to you, right? <laughs> And yeah, they use all their fingers when they wave to you. They have no tasty cakes here. So it's like, and I heard that they screwed up the butterscotch crimpets. They added some other crap to it. And they're not quite the same. Anyway, someone wrote something in the Charlotte Observer that I thought was bullshit. And I called them up on the phone and I said, you know, not only did you believe this idiot and wrote the wrong answers, but now all of your readers have the wrong answers in sales. It was like a sales quiz or something. Mm -hmm. So they come over to my place. And the next Monday, the article was about me, my philosophy of sales, my phone ringing off the hook. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this guy's not a good writer. I'm a better writer than this guy. So I go to the Observer and I say, I want to write an article on sales. And they say, well, no, you'll, you know, you'll get too much notoriety. You'll make too much money. I go, no, I'll, I'll do it for free. No, no, no. So they wouldn't allow me to put an article in there. And I said to the woman who's in charge I said, I just want to write an article on selling skills. And she said, it'll never happen. And I said, no, it'll never happen here. And I left and I went, uh, literally bumped into the guy who was the publisher of the Charlotte Business Journal. I had done other business with them, selling them some stuff. And we meet in the middle of the street, Joe, mm -hmm. crossing from one street to another. And... He looked at me and he goes, what the fuck were you doing in the Charlotte Observer? Because that's their main competition. I said, well, they did this article. And he goes, you have time for a cup of coffee? I go, sure. So we go to the coffee shop. And he said, you know, 30% of our readers are in sales. We don't give them anything. I said, why don't I write a weekly column on selling skills? And mm -hmm. he goes, that sounds like a great idea. Now, let me tell you about the existence of God. Okay. As we're talking... The people who turned me down walked by our booth. <laughs> Perfect. Literally. And and so I we made a deal that I would not be paid for that, but he would get me in other papers. Within two years, I was in a hundred papers. Wow. In one article and and that literally launched my career, not just as a writer, but as a speaker. And as an expert, I went from an expert to being actually an authority because when you write it, you know, it's way, way better. One of the lines I always got from you, I heard from way back in the day, writing leads to wealth. And that's so true there. Yep. I mean, your, your, your example of that, how I came in contact with your material and, and discovered you in the 90s, I, I, I was an accountant and I was a shitty accountant. I was so bad. And I'm working at a public accounting firm, blah, blah, blah. Next thing I know, I switched jobs a couple of times. It still wasn't working out. And I was in a, working at a radio station as an accountant in Philly. And the general manager came to me once and said, hey, listen, we like you working here, um, but we think you're in the wrong end of the building. We think you, you should be in the sales room. So anyway, I switched into sales. And then I don't know what to do. They gave me a phone book. Like, it was just like 100% like commission. I had no idea what I was doing. They gave me a phone book. And then one guy pulled me aside, saw me struggling, and he goes, pull, the old timer pulled me aside and said, listen, dude, Joe, you got to grab the Philadelphia Business Journal because it's going to have all the new companies coming in. It's what's, what's going on, what's new, what's emerging. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get some great leads in there. 
So I'm tearing the book. I, I, I subscribe. I'm tearing the. Uh, I'm, I tear each episode apart or addition apart. And then I always see in the back it says like sales moves, right? And I'm like, I read it. And I'm like, this is exactly what I need. There's like no training. I had zero training whatsoever. Uh, and then it was like how to open a call, how to follow up, how to follow through, how to handle objections, how to get an appointment on the phone. And I start cutting them out. I'm like, it's exactly it's way before the internet, way before Google. I'm cutting them out. And I like make a copy, right? And then I, I have like 10 of them. Like I need, I got to keep these. I make a binder, right? And the next thing, all right, I got 20 <laughs> of them. Then I'm like, wait a second. I'm going to put like how to open the call up front, how to close in the back, how to get a referral after that. I made my own training binder after like a year because you had one like every week, right? It came out like one a week. Oh, yeah. I had like 50, yeah. 60 articles. I had a binder people were stealing from me. They're like, oh, I got to see that. I got to see that. And so I had the book. And then a couple of years later, I see this. It was the easiest sale ever. You come up with the sales Bible. It was kind of like your art, the best of your articles compiled together, right? Like in, it's exactly what it was. Go yeah. ahead, take it from there. How, how'd you get? Now, how'd you crazy go from, or what? Yeah, how, how'd you go from writing to publishing? I mean, that's a huge step. Well, I introduced Harvey McKay, the guy who wrote Swim of the Sharks, oh, at yeah. an event here in Charlotte. And we became friends. All Jews are friends, just like all Italians are friends. And I looked to see whose publisher was, and some guy in New York. And I said, I called him up on the phone. He he had no listed number. So I I made it my mission to find this guy's number. And I called the PR department of William Morrow, and they go, Don't tell anybody, but and then they gave me the number. <laughs> I call this guy on the phone, Adrian Zakheim, and I said, I'm, I'm Jeffrey Gittimer, da, 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 da. and he goes, how'd you get this number? I said, I'm in sales. How do you think I got it? And so he, he made one appointment with me. I cold called the rest of the people in New York City, and this guy bought. He, he bought a, co a compilation of my articles. That mm -hmm. became the book. I never wrote a book. I just wrote an article. Mm -hmm. And that was my first book that came out in 1994. For those of you who were born in 98, and it instant bestseller, probably more relevant today than back then. Like yeah. it's well, crazy. and be advised, I've updated it five times. Mm -hmm. So every time a new edition comes out, and you see that book is not the sales bible, sales bible new edition. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and, and that way, you know that I'm talking about social media i'm mm -hmm. you know i'm making the additions that i need changing some of the things that have gone out of style like for example some people think cold calling still works mm -hmm. which is there are dumb things in sales but cold calling is among the dumbest i just something i learned from you when i was in that realm of cold calling and it's very rare i do it now but when i'm like taking a shot at something it's not a great place to sell and i just lines from you it's a great place to learn how right. to sell, right? That's correct. Not a great it, place to make a sale, great place to learn how to sell. And you could try stuff out. You got to be creative. But yeah, it's it just, you talk to 10 people and 10 or nine are pissed off as soon as you talk to them, right? Because you've interrupted them. It's like yeah. that interruption marketing. Yeah. But one thing about the book, I think is really cool. The, uh, the, the sales Bible. Like, I love the first quote, nothing happened until the sale is made. And like salespeople sometimes get crapped on. Like, it's like, Oh, what are you going to be a salesman? Yep. Or, yeah, but like nothing, there's nothing to lawyer. There's nothing to account for. There's nothing to litigate until something's sold and there's money involved, right? Nothing to ship, nothing to pack, nothing to make, nothing to do shit with. Not you make market. a sale, you win. You know? yeah. yeah. There's nothing happens anywhere until a sale is made, right? And then some money comes in and then everything correct. else can happen, right? That's correct. And so another thing of the book I think is so cool. Like this is one of my top 10 books of all time. I've never seen a book where the table of contents don't show up to the 28th page. There's no, like it literally, if you rip, if, okay. if I just rip the top, the first 28 pages out, the book's worth it. Like it's worth that. And I, you didn't get to the table of contents correct. yet. That's correct. It, it's Here, worth it. There's a reason. And the reason is the same guy who wouldn't grant me a meeting. I finally found his number. Mm -hmm. uh, he said the first 50 pages of the book makes the book or not. 
And I went home and I go, no, it's the first five pages that make the book. Mm -hmm. Like if I got you for five pages, so why would I put the table of contents, the most boring freaking thing on the planet yeah. in the first five pages when I could put info that hooks you into it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're in. I mean, yes. you're in. And and I can tell people that they suck. I can tell people that they're stupid and that they waste time and they love it. Because I'm real with them. I'm Philly. I'm New York. And then the dedication, they're usually kind of sappy. I love the dedication. Your dedication is, I want to dedicate this book and, and issue a special thank you to everyone who ever told me no. So yeah. cool. That's, that's, a, just a, that's a perfect sales dedication there. Yep. So let's dive into this. couple things. It's the first time okay. I heard like, you speak about selling. You People are trying to sell things. You try to create the mindset. You're writing. You're, you want people to learn how to buy. Your, your quote is what? People don't like to be sold. They be but sold, but they love to buy. Correct. Love it. Where'd you come up with that? So think about this. Well, huh, I came up with it because I try to do the opposite. Whatever, if somebody's going to do a sales pitch, but I walk in and I know why they buy, mm -hmm. I win. Let me show you my boring slides. I don't care about your slides. I don't care about you. So I'm going to find out what the buying motive of the customer is. And I just shortened it down to people don't like to be sold, but they love to buy. Then I trademarked it. Mm -hmm. So some other jackass from like Wilmington couldn't use it. <laughs> That's yeah, perfect. And at some point, one of the updates had that you, you, you write the 10.5 commandments, right? You always yeah. go 0.5, right? I think that's, can you just, just uh, explain the 0.5 concept? I think that's pretty yes. cool on all your lists and with 0.5. The 0.5 is glue. Read the 10.5 commandments. What's the 10.5 one? The, yeah, the 0.5 is. I want you to think about it. There's 10 commandments. Yep. And then I add one at the end to make it come together. The 10th one is become. You don't get great at selling in a day. You get great at you selling. You get great at selling day by day. Yep. And so you're looking for these salespeople are looking for the fastest way, the easiest way, the best way to make a sale. And there is no fastest, easiest, best way. Mm -hmm. you, you, go, you go through it. You go through rejection. Yeah. Now, Joe, men know rejection way better than women. Correct? Remember? Uh, absolutely. High school? <laughs> how many rejections were you willing to take <laughs> and now you take the first one the guy says well, i'm not interested you know what it means when the guy says i'm not interested What's that? it means you're not interesting mm -hmm. yep and then you blame it on the guy the guy said he wasn't interested no pal you sucked you couldn't say anything that gained their interest it's not they're not interested. You're not interesting. You didn't present it in a way that was relatable to them. Let's look at the let's look at let's look at the Phillies. They started to win ball games when they shouldn't have. They basically had four players on the team, of which Bryce Harper could run for Jesus and Philly and win. And they hit home runs. They won ball games. They gained the interest of the fans in a in a way that I don't think I've seen it since Carlton mm -hmm. and Schmidt. They own the city yeah. because people want to back a winner, not a whiner. And that's how sales go. If you're a whiner in sales, go do something else. Mm -hmm. Go figure out how to win. Go figure out how to put guys on your team that can help you win. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to stay in Mediocreville and blame everybody else for your shit. Yeah. Another thing I learned from you is that yes. instead of going in, of, hey, we do this, we do that, we do this. Just talk about product knowledge, product knowledge, product knowledge. So much of like when you go work at a big company, it's just they, they you just talk product knowledge. You talk about, I think it's number four in your commandments. You talk about discover, like what story do they have inside their head? And your job is to figure out like what's been their experience, what's in their head, what's their risk that they think it's either real or perceived. You got to ask freaking really good open-ended questions to get them out. Agreed. Right? Now, let's give the listeners three words that they can use that will help them forever. You ready? Yeah, go ahead. 
You walk into some guy's office and you go, hey, tell me about, tell me about, tell me about this picture. Wow, tell me about this piece of art on the wall. Tell me about this trophy. Tell me about these, tell me about some of the books that you've read that you really resonate with. Tell me about how you got this job. Tell me about how the company is going to make more money this year than they did last year. Tell me about. And not tell me a little bit about your business because I can Google that mm -hmm. and you look like an idiot for asking that question. But anything they cannot find online, tell me about brings it out. Mm -hmm. And that I just made it real easy for any sales guy to go in and ask great questions. That's so powerful. You can use tell me about like at a party, at work, oh, yeah. at home. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's crazy. It's that is such a powerful. I, I don't want to get down that route, but yes, you can. <laughs> that is so powerful. You're like someone going, "Hey, tell me about your day. Uh, tell me about the test. Tell me yeah. about math class." Yep. And it's like yep. it's and it's about them, and they just can just talk, and you can figure out what's going on in their head. It, it's so yep. powerful. That 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 phrase and the one I use all the time, and I think I owe you some royalties from the sales I made through the years. Uh, fair enough. You just say, Hey, yeah. you do this. I do that. Fair enough. And you just that fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Killer. Why does that work? That is so freaking easy. And it, and easy, the reason it, it works, the reason it works is because you've already given them some kind of an offer. That's more than fair enough. Mm -hmm. That's the whole deal. Yeah. I was just in Philly a few months ago for my high school reunion. Uh, Haddonfield, New Jersey, Haddonfield Memorial High School, smartest school in New Jersey. Everyone went to college. You know, we have CBS reporters, movie stars, all kinds of people are cool. And I went around the room. There was about 50 people there from my graduating class. And it was my 60th year reunion, just to let you know. Wow. I know. But I just asked people, tell me about what's going on. And they're talking about their grandkids, their vaccine, uh, their <laughs> house at the shore. <laughs> you know, not many people had many things relevant to say, but you could check that off just as well. Oh yeah, they're you know they're the same as they were in high school. Sixty fucking years later, they still don't know what's going on. <laughs> but some people were ex exceptionally interesting. Uh, there's new group that they're involved with, or new thing that they're doing where they've just moved to. And that literally opened them up. And some people actually asked, tell me what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. everybody, but yeah. some did. Yeah. yeah. Some people didn't get the memo to stop yeah, they don't, talking no. and ask a question about not. you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You but didn't... I'll tell you the most interesting thing. There were half a dozen women there that I actually had dates with when I was in high school. And some were still pretty good looking. <laughs> Go for that. That's awesome. Let's go. It was really fun to go to that kind of a thing. Sociologically, the only reason you're there is because you went to school with them. Mm -hmm. Only, only reason. Yeah. Where'd you go to high school? Went to Bishop Kenrick in Narstown. Got you. Yeah. Catholic school. Catholic school. Catholic League. Philly Catholic League. The uh... where did you finish in basketball? Because football oh, right. doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> We were, we were okay. The, the, the good story is one under it. I went to an all Italian grade school called Holy Savior in Narstown. You had to be Italian to go there, uh, at least wow. part Italian. We had one kid with red hair. We had one kid that wasn't Italian who was adopted from Korea. Like, I don't know, I'm five, six with my shoes on. I didn't think I was short, or I didn't know there was St. Patrick's Day. Or I went to, to high school. When I went to high school, all the other schools fed in. I'm like, what are these clovers doing on the wall in March? Like, I had no right. idea what St. Patrick's Day was. It was unspoken of. It was, didn't exist. And St. Patrick's Day started when I was in ninth grade. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I'm not that tall. Right. I, didn't, I didn't realize it when I'm sitting with a whole bunch of other short Italian people. Uh, it's so funny. So funny. So uh, where do you eat in Philly? So right now I live in the suburbs. Are you familiar with Ambler? Uh, you remember yeah. Ambler? They have a yeah, cool Temple was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Temple Ambler. Yeah, they have a great main street, like six or seven awesome restaurants. Down the city, uh, still Budokan Rocks. What else? So there's uh, uh, Ralph's. Uh, oh, Ralph's. Oh, South Philly, definitely. Dante Luigi's awesome. The Saloon. For like special occasions, Panorama on Front Street. 
Like those things are still rocking. So I've been going to Tommy Denix for 50 years. Okay. In the Reading Terminal. Yeah, yeah. And Tommy retired and his son Joey took over. And Joey gets there at four o'clock in the morning to cook roast beef and, and pork. Mm -hmm. And we've been friends for a long, long time because I go to the Amish place and get cinnamon buns and pickles and then I come have a roast beef sandwich. And his statement to me always was, got the pickles? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. So about four months ago, I go there and it was in the morning time. It was like 1030, quarter of 11. And he goes, I just Googled you. You're like kind of a big shit, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I said, don't worry, I'll still pay cash. <laughs> and talking about Google, right? Yeah. You're the one, and this is kind of, I'm just jumping ahead here, but good part. You mentioned it a little bit in the sales Bible, but in the Unbreakable Laws book about build your own brand. And like you're, you're meeting with a customer and you Google the company. What are they doing to you? Like before you exactly. walk in there? What are exactly. they doing? They're Googling your name because they don't yeah. know any better. Yep. They're not Googling your company name because they can do that in two seconds. Yep. But they're Googling you, John Smith. So you better have your own website. Yep. And well, I have a common name. Then put the great in front of it. Put the one and only in front of it. Put damn straight at the end of it. Yep. Put your own name.com. So you have a one-page website. And your website says, this is how I treat my customers. That's it. That's all you need. Mother Google will find it, put you on the front page, and now you're ready to roll. Then you post an article on LinkedIn. Mother Google's going to find it. Mm -hmm. Then you make a, a YouTube video or three. Mother Google's going to find it. Then you get some testimonials. Mother Google's going to find it. One by one by one, Google will help you build a reputation so that when someone Googles your name, you pop up. Critical. Yeah. I, I mean, I got that from you. I would not have, like, I got my name. Well, your name is not exactly Smith either. <laughs> and you, It's funny. There's a Joe Chicarone who's an actor in LA that we go back and forth for top billing when you Google oh, cool. Joe yeah, Like it's either I'm one or he's one. Because you told me like I, I, 10 years ago, you said, go to the website and get your name.com. Like go to like 10 years ago, you, you said that. And so I had that for 10 years and I finally acted on it after I got this podcast going. So like the YouTube, the website with your name, the, the you know, you just, you're, you're very Googleable. People are fine. You got the podcast and the blog and all that stuff. And it's, yep. it's amazing. If you do that for a while, like you have, that's how you build your brand, right? I mean, there's your brand. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. That's invaluable. That totally is invaluable. That's, you don't um, build it in a day. You build it day by day. Day by day. 10.5. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And then how about this? Moving on with the sales Bible questions. Yeah. The one thing I think differentiates you a little bit from the average like sales trainer is like an mm -hmm. average sales trainer for say a big corporation is like, you're just product knowledge, product knowledge, product knowledge. You're the other side. You're like questions. Like if you're going to prepare, prepare, not in terms of you of the customer. Mm -hmm. And then, and like with my team, there, it's imperative. You're, if you're going to spend any time prepping, you're going to do at least three amazing, open-ended, thought-provoking, and mostly engaging questions that's going to start the conversation and really figure out what's going on in that prospect's head. I right? agree. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you one other thing. This is big. Go ahead. I walk into a room and there's a CEO. First thing I ask him, Bob, where'd you grow up? And he'll go, well, I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland. Now, I can say, I can give all my knowledge about Cleveland, which is not big, but, you know, you still, it's Cleveland. I want to know, has he ever been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Does he love LeBron or hate LeBron? Those are the things I want to know about him personally. But when I ask, where did you grow up? It takes him back to his family home. And there's an emotional engagement immediately that you may not be aware of, but he certainly is. Mm -hmm. Might be about fights with their siblings, might have been their mom or dad passed on. Something about it is an emotional engagement immediately. And that way, I've started the conversation on the emotional side, not the logical side. Because mm -hmm. the sale is going to be made emotionally and then justified logically. Yeah. So... 
I'm I'm all about that emotional question to start out with. Yeah. And when you start emotionally and they start talking about where they grew up and and the, do they like LeBron, hate LeBron, love the Phillies, hate the Phillies, and they start going into that. When you do give them that that maybe that time where they they do want like that one product fact that they right. tell me it's so sticky that fact because they're engaged in the conversation. Like they're like there's that such there's yeah. that connection where you're yeah, like speaking of Speaking of shit that you hate, tell me about your copier. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can always break into a product question easily mm -hmm. yeah. and make it funny. Yep. Speaking of shit you hate, yeah. you know, people go, I hate the Phillies. Uh, you know, it's easy to hate the Phillies. Hometown people hate the Phillies. What else do you hate? How about your car? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's whatever you're selling, get them to that. Mm -hmm. absolutely and then you start emotionally i even see it with my kids where they, they like everything starts emotionally then it's just justified logically and human beings are emotional beings they're not logical like the logic well, comes far, what are the payments yeah <laughs> so true so true another thing that you talk about you speak of begin friendly or don't begin at all right and it friendly is free but how many people are not friendly at all like they're just rude right well keep in mind i grew up selling in philly in new york it's not an easy place to be friendly because people are down to okay what do you want or what's in this for me come on i'm i'm i got another meeting in five minutes what do you got mm -hmm. and so you have to learn how to say to the other person look i said i'm probably not the best person to give you a talk in five minutes but if you give me a time to come back when I can have six minutes or even 10 minutes, I'll be more than happy to come back. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be forced into a situation and the guy will respect the shit out of it for you not wanting to go into your two minute pitch. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't, he's not your guy anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you live in the Northeast and I don't consider Boston in the Northeast, it's Philly and New York. But the challenge the challenge that you have there is you have a limited amount of time and you have people that know everything or think they know everything and you have to be quick and you have to be engaging and you have to be different than the 10 other people that came in front of you mm -hmm. or the two other people that are waiting out in the lobby to go next. Mm -hmm. and another concept that I got from you early on that I, I, I think that's undervalued in sales, like a big idea is, like your best new prospects are not new prospects that your present customers like to upsell mm -hmm. them or, or like, like either, either have a deeper relationship with them, upsell them. Could you take it from there? I think that is just, that's a big concept. I think. And get referrals from them. Yeah. And, and get referrals. referrals. From them. Yep. Okay. So you can either make a hundred cold calls or get one referral, which would you rather have? Referral. Yeah. And, but people don't teach how to get a referral. They only teach how to cold call. I'm barking up the wrong tree there. I don't want to, I don't want to learn how to make a cold call. I want to learn how to earn a referral. I want to learn how to build a relationship. And the secret is, and this is big. If you can turn the relationship into a friendship, you win. When you were growing up, do people call you Joey? Oh, sure. When I was little. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who were those people? Really close friends. Yeah. Family, close friends. Yep. Yeah. Joe, you're not eating enough. <laughs> were you there? Were you, you, <laughs> were you there? Oh my God. Yeah. Like 12 years old, you had six meatballs. Like, oh, you got to eat more. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm going to die. I'm like, I can't eat more. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Then, but you know what? You cry when they passed. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Jerry Blavitt's dead. What's that I about? He, yeah, I think he did. <laughs> He, he did that a few months ago. Yeah, he was still on the radio like a year ago or something. Like he was always on like ninety eight one doing the oldies show on Friday nights or something. Get back to questions. I give a great quote in the book. It goes: "No questions, no answers. No answers, no sales. No sales, no money. Any questions? How important questions are? Like it's how I think. I think questions are the most underutilized. No money, no food." Yeah, no money, no food. I mean, it just yeah. it, it, the lack of yeah, it, 
People don't spend enough time crafting great questions to go into a sales call and they wonder why they're not invited back or have access to, to, to go in. Anyway, I, I think that's just so overlooked still in this day. What do you think? The, the deal is you become known by the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't become known by your 27 slides from marketing. Yeah, no, no. You can't make a sales call by saying, hey, I know you don't know me, but I just got these new slides from marketing. Could I come over and bore the shit out of you for 20 minutes? <laughs> you said on one of the calls, like your brochure, you could write like four letter words on it and, and let, no one, no one ever yeah. see them. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You could put up yours in your brochure and no one ever finds it. That's, like that. <laughs> that is pathetically true. That's the problem. It's pathetically true. And when you put yourself in that context, what you're doing is saying, okay, this is ridiculous. I can't do this with my customer. I have to do something different than the other guy, better than the other guy, and of value in the, per in the perception of the customer. He's got to perceive I'm a valuable person, mm -hmm. that my offer is going to be valuable to them. Otherwise, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, can I send you a quote? No, I don't want your quote. I really don't. I, I'm like, what do I need a quote for? I need a person that I can have a relationship with. And anybody that wants a quote is not your best customer anyway, because they're going to take the lowest no matter what. Yep. And if you get to the point at the end, they say, can, can we have a, a quote? Or even something you'll say, okay, let me think about it. Or I have to talk to someone else. Say, let's take the first one. I say someone's in sales. Can you call me back in three months? I got to think about it. What's, what's a salesperson to do there? Well, First of all, you set yourself up for that by not establishing ground rules. So you meet with somebody and say, listen, you can tell me anything you want, except I don't want, I want to think about it. That's a la it's unacceptable to me. So just tell me to get out because your price is too high or I don't like you, or let's have another meeting. Those are my, those are your choices. And when somebody says, I want to think about it to me, I go, great. I was hoping you would say that. And they go, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. People who say I want to think about it, they become our best customers. And that way, I've thrown the guy completely off guard. And it's in the sales Bible. I was hoping you would say that. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to say then. Your price is too high. I was hoping you would say that. I have another supplier. I was hoping you would say that. And that just lowers their defenses or just low. It just makes the conversation real. It makes you normal. It makes yeah. you fucking normal. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that I was hoping you say that, like you mentioned when people complain, you, they'll say like, oh, X happened. You go, great. That's like my favorite problem to solve. Or like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm the perfect person to handle that. That's I love when I get that. You know what? That's only the third time I've heard that this week. Whatever sales role you're in, like customers come with your problems, especially if they're pissed, they come at you. You could say, you know what? Thanks for bringing that to my attention. That's one of the things I love to fix. Yep. I got, and I fix when you thank people for swearing at you, they don't know mm -hmm. what to say. No, yeah, sure. Yeah. And you always say, never say you're sorry, right? Like you're, you're like, no, never say, never. what do you say no. when someone comes at you? you I apologize. Yeah. Never say you're sorry though, right? No. I teach my kids. Nobody says they're sorry in my family. You apologize. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about this? Let's real quick wrapping up the twenty one point five laws book. Mm -hmm. I love the earn trust. Mm -hmm. How does someone in this day and age? I think this is law number fourteen. And you say no trust, no nothing. Uh, right. How does someone earn trust? Maybe they're new in their role, new customer base, new sales rep in a new geography. What's the fastest way to earn trust? There's two ways. Number one, always tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So you become known as a truth teller. Number two, have social proof that says, the one thing I love about Joe is he always tells me exactly how it is. He always tells me exactly what's going to happen. He mm -hmm. always tells me the truth. Social proof and your truth will get trust. There's no other way. Yeah. And also, too, I guess you would tie in a little bit that you always mention, like voice of customer, like people that use yep. you, you, use your customer yeah. to, to Social do that. Social proof. Exactly. 
Because all right, social proof. Because if you say it, it's just whatever. But if like a cost, a real legit customer who has the same business as you says it, when you say it about yourself, it's bragging. Mm -hmm. When somebody else says it about you, it's proof. Mm -hmm. Creativity wise, you keep cranking out the content. You have these monthly book clubs, which I'm a part of. You have a great platform where if you miss the call, it's on like an hour later. You could see the whole thing an hour later, watch yep. it on your time. Really, really well yep. done. Your content, how, what's your creation process look like? You always talk about like the day-by-day, step-by-step. What, what's like, like when you wake up, what's your creativity routine? What's it look like? The first thing I do is I spend an hour in my library before everybody else wakes up. In that hour, I read, I write, I prepare, and that causes me to think and create. I do those five things every single day, even if my ass falls off. I don't know what day of the week is. I don't care what day of the week it is. I have I travel a lot, so there's two time zones, daytime and nighttime. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly when it is. I can just look out the window and go, oh, it's still daytime. I'm good. <laughs> Okay, but more important than that, and I think it's just very important for a salesperson to understand, your state of mind and your self-confidence, that's the key to your preparation in the morning. Like, I'm going to go out and kill them. So where do I get content? I pay attention. I talk to people. I talk to everybody. I talk to the cashier. I talk to the guy standing behind me. I'll, I'll stand in the grocery store, Joe, and I'll see somebody with a basket behind me and I go, you're buying this shit? Who's going to, who eats this? <laughs> and people will like, well, I kind of like it. And they'll, it's a conversation. In two seconds, it's a conversation. Now, I grew up in Philly where my parents said, don't talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to beat that rule down because I, I knew I wasn't going to make friends if I didn't talk to people. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to build relationships if I didn't talk to people. So I go to networking events. I go to trade shows. I talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when you talk to everybody, you learn things, mm -hmm. new things. That's what I'm after. Yeah. So when you get up and write, are you typing or are you using audio? Like, what do you do? Voice to text. Voice so you get up and you're like speaking into your MacBook or something like that? or If I have an idea, something that gives me an idea. Sometimes I read something that gives me an idea. Like here, I'm big on this guy, John Patterson, who founded the National Catch Register Company. And today I got this book in the mail. Oh. It's John Patterson, Frontier Industrial Welfare. Yep. And I'll read a chapter. Yeah, exactly. The Little Platinum Book of Ching based on that and out of business and in again so he talks about his own failures so it's just the early years of what he did the guy's mm -hmm. amazing the guy's freaking amazing and so then i'll go okay so what did i learn in kindergarten well what i learned in kindergarten when i started my own business in your first couple of years in business you're in kindergarten mm -hmm. people will tell you they're going to pay and they don't pay people will give you a check and the check bounces there's no such thing as a bounce check anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, sure, sure. It's important for you to learn from your failure and from your successes. Both great teachers. How, and then when say you're writing a book, you're always working on a book. What, what, what are you working on now? Like, I'm like, working on a, you know, the book, Good to Great? Yeah. John, Jim I'm Collins. Working on a book, yeah, I'm working on a book now called From Shit to Great because you're not that good. Really? <laughs> yeah. And when you write that, are you speaking into yeah, the computer or are you typing? That can happen. That can happen anytime. Mm -hmm. It might be 10 o'clock at night. It might be 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And I see the file up on my laptop and I'll go, oh, let me knock this out. Let me, here's a thought. Mm -hmm. I don't write without a thought. Mm -hmm. And my, yeah, this is my thinker. Mm -hmm. And I just, I pop open myself. I'm ready to roll. Yep. And I, I text myself everything. I, I text myself everything. My daughter, 
just texted me as we were talking and she's talking we're going to the olivia rodrigo oh yeah there you go i want to get him back my daughter likes her i have a, I have a 11 year old daughter she's a she just sent me something <laughs> olivia rodrigo tiny desk concert you know the tickets were only 1500 bucks so we're going <laughs> <laughs> perfect good dad you're a good dad man that's awesome um, we'll do wrapping up here. First off, that's awesome. Uh, wrapping up here. I know your time is limited. A couple, I have a couple rapid fire fun questions. Uh, All right. I'll throw it to you. Here we go. Uh, a couple I'll do fun. the best I can. What is something that you believe that other people think is insane? I think cold calling is a waste of time. Perfect. How about this? What purchase of $100 or less has most positively impacted your life? 20 years ago, for $8, I bought a first edition of a Napoleon Hill book called How to Sell Your Way Through Life. Oh, that's great. So good. That's Eight great, bucks. It's such a great book. Uh, no, and I bought another $5 book. Uh, I bought a first edition autographed in a used bookstore of Dale Carnegie how to stop worrying and start living. Yeah, so good. Five bucks. And uh, that's great. And then something just another one I love of yours here, just to pop it up. I mentioned it. The oh, one yeah. you wrote about the truthful living. That's uh, yep. all. I was, I was on the money. Cool. Next one. That's a great one. How about this? Uh, what is the best, most worthwhile investment you ever made? Could be investment of time, money, energy. The best investment that I ever made was dropping out of school when I was going to be a sophomore and traveling around Europe for one year. Awesome. At the time, it cost me about three grand. At that moment, I realized I knew nothing. Because mm -hmm. you're in Philly, you think you know everything. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, you get out of an airplane, you go, I don't know shit. Yeah. I became a student for life. Yep. After you dropped out of college. Yep. I did not become a student until I dropped out of college. Title That's of a book. That's great. That was Temple, right? Temple University? Yep. Temple yeah. University. My son's there now. We're hoping he doesn't drop out. But uh, if he well, does, I, hopefully he can. I went, tell him I went on the five year you don't quite graduate program, which I completed successfully. <laughs> you got your certificate. Perfect. How about this? What is the worst advice you see or hear being dispensed in your world, in your industry? Um, pretty interesting. There are words that I'm pissed off about. Let's talk about a big one. Onboarding. Mm -hmm. What the fuck does that mean? Seriously. Scaling. What, what is what's scaling? Is it like you caught a fish and you're scraping the scales off of it? I don't understand that. There's even a worse one. Let me think about it for just a second. The challenge that you have in business is listening to people that talk about bullshit. And there's so much bullshit out there. It's not, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to scale my business. I don't know how to onboard people. I just do what's natural. Mm -hmm. I don't need a buzzword. Yeah. I need a circumstance. I need to be human to human. Yeah. And that human to human, I think that's why like your writing connects and you have what, 18 books, whatever yeah. number you have. Yeah. It connects because it feels like we, you grab the beer with you and you're sitting at the bar and you're telling, you're talking right. about that topic. It's just, you're just sitting there talking. I write and, like I talk. Yeah. There's, I write like I talk. Yep. It, it's so real. It's so like, human to human it's if you're into selling and you're into if you want to learn how to get shit done you get the book and it's like you're talking about how to be productive like it, it's just very there's no fluff you know what i mean all the fluff's gone it's just like it's just like right in your face and you get smacked in the face with it which is pretty cool i and and get shit done is it hold on open up the, open up get shit done what's the first thing in there if you're it's, it gets it done this is about uh, yeah this is uh 
It's all meat. Yeah. It's just, if you're a vegan, you're not going to like it because this book is all meat. <laughs> just offend people right off the first page. You know what I mean? I don't care. I don't <laughs> listen. If you're offended by me, you don't get me. I'm not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Another question about this. What have you changed your mind about over the last few years? Um, I've changed my mind about several things, but I've rededicated myself to being a better father. Mm -hmm. And I was already a good one when I started. Nothing is more important than raising your kids the right way or doing the right thing by your kids. Mm -hmm. And this is a confession. I have four daughters, four granddaughters, and a great granddaughter, nine women. All girls, all the time. <laughs> Luckily, they're all Eagles fans. Luckily, they're all Phillies fans. And we're with everyone except one granddaughter lives within 20 miles of me. So we're very close as a family. We go to ball games together. We go to meals together. And it family sp springs everything within you to be better. Mm -hmm. Because you know your kids are judging you. And they want to be so proud of you, they can't stand it. Yep. That's great. That's great parenting there. They all live close by. You know you did a good job. They all live close by and they still want to hang yep. out with you. Yeah. Yep. And they're not thinking about moving. Yeah, that's great. Last one here. What do you believe is true, even though you can't prove it? No one landed on the moon. Really? Yep. You don't think anyone, you don't think anyone landed on the moon? Eight. Really? Neil, Neil didn't walk on the moon? Nope. No, really? What, what makes you believe that? That's interesting. They would never swear that they landed on the moon on the Bible. Look it up. Okay. There's a Vegas studio that they, where they reenacted everything. There's all kinds of photos that are inaccurate. Think about it. We didn't do anything for the next 30 years. Why wouldn't we go back? Why wouldn't we put a, an outhouse there where you could go take a leak on the moon? That's I think Google. I think Google. I, I've never heard about that. I'm going to check that out. No landing on the moon. That is freaking interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Cool. Wrapping this up here, Jeffrey. We spoke about a lot. We talked about the, how you got started in writing. Of the first person told you no. The sales bible. The 21.5 laws of selling. Mm -hmm. Questions. If you could have everyone listening take just one lesson away from everything we discussed, what would that lesson be? Well, there's 20 that come immediately to mind, but I'll tell you an interesting one. Go to sleep sober. Okay. Write everything down before you go to bed of what you got to do the next day. Go to sleep sober and you'll wake up the following morning with answers and you'll actually feel good. Wow. That just starts the next day. You're clear headed, clear mind. Why does somebody need a fucking beer to watch Netflix at night and waste their life? Mm -hmm. While you're watching Netflix, I'm writing another book. Mm -hmm. In fact, I should write a book that says, I wrote this while you were watching Netflix and pissing your life away. <laughs> that's actually a book title I wrote this while you're watching Netflix <laughs> hold on I'm going to record that that's so funny I wrote this while you were watching Netflix that's perfect I wrote this book while you were watching Netflix and pissing your life away uh, for I might actually add to that while you were watching Netflix drinking a beer and pissing your life away Jeffrey if people are looking for you and what you do online and what you got going on where can we find Just you go to Put my name in, Gittimer, G-I-T-O-M-E-R. You can go to Gittimer.com. You can go to Gittimer on YouTube. You can go to Gittimer on Twitter. You can go to Gittimer anywhere and find me. Yes, sir. I'll put all of them in the show notes, but hit, Jeff you. hit Jeffrey up for the YouTube station. Does a monthly book club. That's awesome. You get the yeah. signed copy of the book. You get to ask Jeffrey questions on the book. And there's some just great, I mean, I've been in sales for 20 years. I, I learned something every time. 
every one of those book clubs, I'm taking notes and I'm learning. So the material just keeps flowing. And I've given you my text because you're from Philly. Mm -hmm. So if you're not from Philly, don't be asking me for my fucking text because I'm not going to give it to you. I appreciate you texting me. No, I appreciate that. It took me uh, 20 years of reading your books to get the text. So I appreciate you, man. Awesome, dude. The guest is Jeffrey Gittimer. You take care of yourself. All right, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us, man. Peace out. Keep rocking, buddy. Go birds.